good evening, comrades, and welcome to our third session on the history of Zionism, which is uh, being given by uh, oh. Tony Greenstein. Um, tonight's talk is entitled Zionism during the Holocaust, which obviously is a historically very important uh, topic, but also politically um, during the recent uh, anti-Semitism witch hunt in the Labour Party, uh, many of the allegations uh, about alleged anti-Semitism by members of the left turned around their discussion of this topic. You'll all remember, I think, famously Ken Livingstone's uh, ambushing by John Mann and uh, other incidents of that sort. So it's, it's obviously a very important historical topic and uh, one I'm sure which uh, all the comrades will learn something uh, this evening. Uh, I certainly have in the uh, in the sessions that we've had before. Uh, the format for this evening is uh, the same as usual. Tony will speak for around about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll take questions and uh, discussion. Um, just two things on the questions and discussion. Um, many of you have some very good comments in the chat, um, in the chat box, and um, I can sometimes see them as chair, but sometimes it's not. Um, not always easy to do that. So I'd be very grateful, please, if people would um, uh, rate, use the raise hand function and try to come in to say their questions. Alternatively, if you've got technical problems or anything else, then use the question and answer button. It is very difficult to take questions from the chat. And, um, you know, I, I think it, it doesn't really help the discussion. So please, if you could do that. Um, so I'll, um, I'll ask Tony to begin now, and um, we're looking forward to this session on Zionism and the Holocaust. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Uh, tonight's talk is on, the official title is Zionism during the Holocaust. And it covers, in essence, the relationship between the Zionist movement <coughs> and the Nazis between 1933 uh, and 45. Uh, it is, uh, dare I say it, an explosive topic. Uh, it mentioned Zionist relationship, Zionist collaboration, or, or however you describe it with the Nazis, and you'll certainly provoke a surefire uh, response from the Zionists. Uh, who will accuse you of anti-Semitism. In fact, one of the 11 illustrations uh, in the International Holocaust Remembrance of Alliance Misdefinition of Anti-Semitism says that to compare Israeli policies with the Nazis is itself anti-Semitic. And so it rules out all discussion of, of the topic. Uh, I have to add, uh, that if the IHRA is correct, then uh, people like the late Professor Zev Sternhall of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who made just such a comparison, uh, and who was a, a survivor, a child survivor of the Holocaust, is therefore deemed anti-Semitic. Likewise, Professor Yehuda Elkaner, who was the rector, again, he's died, the rector of the Free University, uh, in Budapest before Victor Orban forced them out. Again, uh, he, he was a survivor of Auschwitz, but he too, because he made just such comparisons, would also be anti-Semitic. And there are a number of other Holocaust survivors, survivors of the camps uh, who would be defined as anti-Semitic. So I think we need to bury that one once and for all. Of course, it's not, of course, it's not anti-Semitic uh, if it's true. And that's the whole point. Uh, there was a relationship between the Zionists and the Nazis, and it's one that they don't wish to publicize today. But it's also one which comes up every now and again. It's one of the skeletons <coughs> in the Zionist cupboard. Uh, and there's, uh, it has, as Kevin said, when Ken Livingston uh, came out, uh, really an ad lib comment that. Uh, Hitler supported Zionism, uh, there was absolute uproar. And you'll remember the confrontation of John Mann uh, with uh, Livingston, uh, accusing of being a Nazi supporter. Uh, Moshe Machava 
uh, was suspended in essence, uh, although the pretext was he was a member of the Communist Party of Great Britain, the meat of it, the substance of uh, the reason for his fat, not ex suspension, expulsion, uh, was that he again had quoted from Reinhard Heydrich uh, as to uh, how the Nazis gave preference and support to the Zionists in Nazi Germany. But possibly the most famous example, which I suspect many or most of you have not heard of, is Hannah Arendt, who is probably the most famous uh, political philosopher uh, of the 20th century. And she herself was a refugee uh, from Nazi Germany. And she only, in fact, just escaped. She went to France, was interned there, escaped from the internment camp, uh, and made her way to America. And uh, Hannah Arendt, who was herself in her early years a Zionist activist, uh, but a Zionist who was thoughtful, unlike most Zionists. Uh, she wrote a, an essay, uh, Zionism Reconsidered, became famous, well, she became famous for a number of books. The Origins of Totalitarianism was uh, maybe the most famous uh, of all her books, but she became famous in 1961, 62, when she wrote a series of reports for the New Yorker on the Eichmann trial, and she uh, published a, a book, Eichmann in Jerusalem. Uh, and for anyone who hasn't read it, I can only suggest you do read it because she touched on all the subjects that the Eichmann trial had been designed to avoid, not least the relationship of the Zionist movement during the war uh, to the Holocaust, and she made uh, a number, one very famous conclusion, which was that if there had been no Jewish leadership during the Holocaust, uh, then far more Jews would have survived. And that caused uproar, but uh, her conclusion really can't be faulted. And she was subject to an absolutely vicious attacks by the Zionists. Uh, attacks which uh, I think many of us are, are familiar with, but I'll, I'll read it and it's, it's in her uh, book, page in fact, the, the edition I have, page 282 and three, and she said, the campaign was conducted with all the well-known means of image making and opinion manipulation. It got much more attention than the controversy. It was as though the pieces written against the book, brackets and more frequently against its author, came, quote, out of a mimeographing machine, unquote. The clamor centered on the image of a book which was never written and touched upon subjects that often had not only been men not mentioned by me, but had never occurred to me before. So this was the nature of the Zionist attack. I mean, uh, and this is standard, isn't it? The Zionists attack people for things they haven't said, but they imply that they have, or assert that they have said them. So this is really my introduction. And I first want to make a distinction and a sharp separation between Zionists and Zionism, or ordinary rank and file Zionists and the Zionist leadership. For example, uh, a subject I'll be touching upon uh, is Havara, the trade agreement between Nazi Germany and the Zionist movement. There is absolutely no doubt that the vast majority of rank and file Zionists, for instance, in America, where the campaign uh, had its base, were absolutely uh, uh, supportive of the boycott of Nazi Germany from the very beginning. And it's equally true that almost unanimously the Zionist leadership in Palestine and, uh, and in London as well was opposed to the boycott, as was the Jewish bourgeoisie, I should add, as well, the anti-Zionist bourgeoisie. Uh, so it was a class question as much as anything else. So I, I want to make that sharp separation. Uh, and it's important that one does do that because we can say that the Zionists collaborated uh, with the Nazis, but that doesn't mean every Zionist collaborated. But, uh, on the contrary, uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto, for instance, the leader, the first leader of the Warsaw Ghetto resistance was Mordechai Anilwitz of Pasha Mahatzeh. Uh, and uh, he led it with the Bund, the, the major anti-Zionist Jewish party in Poland, 
uh, and Marek Edelman, who was the last commander of uh, the Jewish resistance, said for the six, eight months uh, that the anti-Zionists and the Zionists worked together, there were no ideological differences about how they should work. The fact there were Zionists was immaterial in the sense that their Zionism was irrelevant. Uh, they fought the Nazis despite being Zionists, not because of the fact that they were Zionists. But I just want to emphasize that just, just because the ideology and the movement of Zionism collaborated and worked with the Nazis at particular times and in particular ways, that doesn't therefore apply to individual Zionists. Uh, who also, uh, let's be quite blunt, when the Nazis sent Jews to the, the gas chambers, they didn't differentiate between whether you were an anti-Zionist or a Zionist. Uh, you were a Jew as far as they were concerned, and that was it. Of course, uh, today, we, uh, the Holocaust is on the lips of Zionism everywhere. Uh, there are museums, memorials, uh, and so on. Israel takes thousands of its school students to Auschwitz each year, not in order to, to uh, let them, uh, to inform them and to educate them about the evils and the dangers of racism, but on the contrary, <clears throat> to instill them with a nationalism and chauvinism, which says that racism committed by Jews is right because no non-Jew can, uh, can be accepted. All non-Jews have uh, anti-Semitism ingrained in them. Uh, and in fact, even the so-called definition of anti-Semitism, uh, the IHRA definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, which whose sole purpose is to conflate and confuse anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, it, it's named after the Holocaust. So it uses the Holocaust to give legitimacy uh, to a definition that uh, whose sole purpose is to attack opposition to Israel and the Zionist ideology. But there are many, many uh, other examples. Uh, Edith Zertel, an Israeli professor, uh, wrote that uh, there isn't a war that Israel has fought which hasn't been in the name of Auschwitz. So Israel has mercilessly exploited the memory of the Holocaust. But its record during the Holocaust was a very different matter, and that's what I will be concentrating on. The focus on collaboration, we, uh, I've mentioned Zionist Nazi collaboration, but in many ways, a focus on the word collaboration can be a distraction because collaboration can take many different forms. And I, I've written elsewhere that there really is two forms of collaboration. There was a form of collaboration where the Nazis put a gun to your head and said you either work with us or you, you die. Uh, and that was the case with many of the Jewish councils, the Yiddenrat uh, in Nazi occupied Europe. In other words, people collaborated or cooperated because they had no choice. But there was also another form of collaboration. And that was a form of collaboration, the Zionist movement inside Europe and outside for that matter, engaged it, which was voluntary collaboration, where they volunteered to work with and volunteered to collaborate. And Havara, which I've mentioned, is a prime example of that collaboration. Now, the first thing to say about Zionism is in its belief that the Jews formed a separate people or race from the non-Jews amongst whom they lived that they agreed, they were in almost complete agreement with the Nazis ideologically. And this formed uh, the basis for, for their joint work. And if we look at uh, some of what uh, the, uh, the Nazis said, I think you'll understand what I mean. The main, the principal Zion, the Nazi theoretician was a man named Alfred Rosenberg. He was a Baltic from Estonia, uh, uh, Nazi. He'd fought in uh, the German revolution with the Freikorps, the counter-revolutionary uh, militia that had been assembled and employed by the Social Democrats. Uh, and he said as early as 1919, Zionism must be vigorously supported in order to encourage a significant number of German Jews to leave for Palestine or other destinations. Uh, and I'm quoting from Francis Nicosia, who's the 
Ral Hilberg Professor of Holocaust Studies at Vermont University in his book, The Third Reich and the Palestine Question. Uh, and it's on page 25. Uh, so, I mean, Nick Asiri is an astute uh, researcher. He's not an anti-Zionist, he's a Zionist. So uh, I don't think we can have any doubt about uh, the veracity of that quote. I, I, and uh, Nick Asiri, uh, comments that Rosenberg intended to use Zionism as a legal justification for depriving German Jews of their civil rights and eventually, quote, the Jewish presence in Germany. In other words, what the Zionists were saying, which was that Jews don't belong in Germany because they're a separate nation, chimed in perfectly with what the Nazis were saying. And so there was a symmetry between them. And it wasn't just Rosenberg, although he was extremely important. Rosenberg, incidentally, uh, was tried, convicted, and hanged at Nuremberg in 1946. So he was one of the major Nazi war criminals. He was minister for the Eastern Territories, the Osterland. I can give you another example, Heinrich Klass, who was uh, the president of the Pan-German League, which was over 100,000 strong, uh, until, uh, and it existed really until it was made illegal after the assassination of the Jewish German foreign minister, uh, Walter Rathenau. And he, Heinrich Klass, Klass said in a book that he wrote under a pseudonym, Daniel Freiman, amongst the Jews themselves, the nationalist movement called Zionism is gaining more and more adherence. They also declare openly that a true assimilation of the Jewish aliens to the host nations would be impossible. The Zionists confirm what the enemies of the Jews have always asserted. So you can see that uh, Zionism was the glove that inserted itself, uh, was the hand that inserted itself into the anti-Semites glove. Uh, they matched perfectly. And Donald Nevat, uh, who wrote a very good book on the Jews in Weimar, Germany, asked whether the German Zionists, quote, reinforced the anti-Semitic stereotype of the Jews as materialists, exploiters, and traitors. Did their assertions of racial and national otherness hasten the day when the Nazis might seek to make Germany Judenrein? Uh, and the reason for this is that the Zionists attack bitterly the Jewish diaspora, what they called the accursed Galut, for its asocial characteristics. Uh, if you listen to some Zionists, and I, I dealt with this in previous talks, uh, that you wouldn't know whether it was a Zionist or an anti-Semite speaking unless you knew beforehand. And J.B. Agus uh, uh, wrote uh, in his book, The Meaning of Jewish History in 1963, that the Zionist program and philosophy he asked if the Zionist program and philosophy contributed decisively to the enormous catastrophe of the extermination of six million Jews by the Nazis by popularizing the notion that the Jews were forever aliens in Europe. And that is really the essential point. The whole essence and basis of Zionist ideology, summed up in the negation of the, the diaspora, is that the Jews do not belong, that the problem, the so-called Jewish question arose because the Jews did not have national soil beneath their feet. It was a blood and soil attitude. So we have to ask ourselves, what was the Jewish, what was the Zionist attitude to the rise of uh, the Nazis? Well, and I want to try and keep an eye on the time because I know I'm, going to uh, go over. Uh, there is no doubt that as soon as the Nazis took power in 1933, in January the 30th, 1933, that the vast majority of Jews instinctively reacted to what they saw as a dire threat to the existence of the German Jewish community. And almost spontaneously, and I have to emphasize, size this almost spontaneously they began an international boycott of everything to do with germany and this became organized later but for, uh, at the start it, it it was a spontaneous movement it was a reaction not only just amongst jews 
Trojanists, socialists, the labor movement also did this. But the Zionist movement was bitterly hostile to any such ideas. And let me give you a quote. And this is a letter that was sent uh, on the 21st of June, 1933, by the Zionist Federation of, of uh, Germany. And it can be found in this book. I'm sorry, it's upside down as it were. It's, it's a Holocaust reader. And the person who wrote it is Lucy Davidovitz. She's, she's no longer alive. Uh, she was a right-wing Zionist historian. And you can find the complete letter in this book. And, and it is indeed a shocking letter. Uh, I'll quote from only a part of it. She said, Zionism has no illusion about the difficulty of the Jewish condition, which consists above all in an abnormal occupational pattern. An answer to the Jewish question, truly satisfying to the national state can be brought about only with a collaboration of the Jewish movement that aims at a social, cultural, and moral renewal of Jewry. So it basically accepted the Nazi criticisms of the Jews. It goes on to say, on the foundation of the new state, which has established the principle of race, fruitful activity for the fatherland is possible. That is between the Zionists and the Nazis. Our acknowledgement of Jewish nationality, remember Jews were German nationals, but Zionists were saying to Hitler, and this was a letter written to Hitler, that Jews are not uh, German nationals, but uh, are not German nationals, but Jewish nationals. Our acknowledgement of Jewish nationality provides for a clear and sincere relationship to the German people and its national and racial realities. Precisely because we don't wish to falsify these fundamentals, because we too are against mixed marriages and are for maintaining the purity of the Jewish group. And it, it, I, I, there's an ellipsis, but uh, it goes on to say the realization of Zionism could only be hurt by resentment of Jews abroad against the German development. Boycott propaganda is in essence fundamentally un Zionist because Zionism wants not to do battle but to convince and to build. Uh, there you have it, I say it. it is a shocking letter, but it's consistent. Uh, when the Zionists attack the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement today against Israel, uh, they are, are at least being consistent. They, they also oppose the Jewish boycott of Nazi Germany and, and for much the same reasons. Uh, and it wasn't uh, just the German Zionist Federation. You might argue that they felt certain compunction because of the circumstances in which they existed. But give, I'll give you, for example, uh, Chaim Weizmann. He was one of the major figures in the Zionist movement. He was president of the World Zionist Organization for most of its uh, existence between 1920 uh, and 1948. He was also the first president of the, of the Israeli state. Uh, and he had a political secretary called Louis, a uh, personal secretary called Louis Namia. Uh, and I quote from, uh, it's a PhD thesis by Etan Bloom. Uh, and here he is quoting uh, from the letters and papers of Chaim Weizmann. And he says, Weizmann who worked closely with Arthur Rupin read the introduction that Namia had written uh, to a, a book by Rupin uh, and, and, he, and Weizmann had to warn Namia not to, and I'm quoting from this uh, thesis, not to be so open in expressing their common toleration of Nazism. Just think about that. Our common toleration of Nazism because quote, the Louts will say, and this is Weizmann speaking, the Louts will say the Jews themselves think that it will be all for the good, that is the rise of the Nazis. But it will, wasn't just them. Bloom also quotes Emma Ludwig, uh, the world famous biographer, who, who quote, expressed the general attitude of the Zionist movement. And he said, Hitler will be forgotten in a few years, but he will have a beautiful monument in Palestine. You know, the coming of the Nazis was rather a welcome thing, 
So many of our German Jews were hovering between two coasts, riding the treacherous current between the Scylla of assimilation and Charabodis of a nodding acquaintance with Jewish things. Thousands who seemed to be completely lost to Judaism were brought back to the fold by Hitler. And for that, I am personally very grateful. Uh, and one can, one could go on. Uh, Rabbi Joachim Prinz, who was the president of the German Zionist Federation and later president of the American Jewish Committee and the vice president of the World Jewish Congress, described the Nazi assumption of power as the, quote, beginning of the Jews return to his Judaism, unquote. So I ask, is it any wonder that the main Jewish, uh, German Jewish organization, the Central Verein, talked about German Zionism as having inflicted a stab in the back to the struggle against Hitler. I think we need to understand as well that the Zionist approach to the Nazis and its record during the Holocaust was no different from its attitude to anti-Semitism before the Holocaust, before the rise of the Nazis. Historically, it was one and the same. What they did with regard to the rise of the Nazis was no different really to their attitude to Edward Drummond, the French uh, anti-Semite and anti-Dreyfusard, and all other Zionist uh, anti-Semitic characters, uh, such as William Gordon Evans, uh, the leader of the British Brothers League. And we, we, we also need to remember that Zionism was a tiny minority within the German Jewish community, something like 2%. So when the Zionists claimed they spoke for Jews, they spoke for very few Jews. Uh, and that really is important uh, again to remember. I want to go on to Havara, the, uh, the trade agreement between the Nazis and the Zionists. As I said, when the, when the Zionists, when the Nazis came to power, Jews launched a boycott of international, uh, a boycott of Nazi Germany. But the Zionists and uh, the Board of Deputies, which was in the hands of the anti-Zionist bourgeoisie in Britain, were vehemently opposed to it. And the Zionists, beginning in June 1933, opened negotiations with Hitler, with the Nazi party, to see if they could reach an agreement on trading relationships, relations between Nazi Germany and Jewish Palestine. And in August, the beginning of August, the 7th of August, uh, 1933, this agreement was concluded. I don't want to go into the mechanics of, uh, of the agreement, but in essence, what happened was that the frozen assets of Jews in Germany were used to purchase machinery which was then exported to Palestine. So in that way, they broke the boycott. They, they provided purchasing power for German factories and helped therefore reduce unemployment. The machinery went to Palestine and it helped build whole industries in uh, Jewish Palestine, printing, brewing works, uh, etc. Uh, it was extremely valuable, something like a hundred million marks remember and that that was in those days uh, was uh, the effect of it. In fact, between 1933 and 1939, 60% of the capital investment in Jewish Palestine came from Nazi Germany. So literally, Hitler helped build the Israeli state. I mean, that, that is the reality. Uh, and this, this agreement was uh, met with absolute fury from Jews internationally. It was so unpopular that at the Prague conference of the Zionist movement, 
1933 in September, just following the agreement, when news of it was announced, the Zionists in the form of Burr Locker simply lied. They denied that they had any part in it. They said it was a private agreement. It had nothing to do with them. But as it turned out, it had everything to do with them. And at the following conference in Lucerne in 1935, the Congress in 1935, uh, the Congress passed a motion supporting Havara. I say it was, it was extremely unpopular. Uh, and I quote from a debate between Boris Vladek, who was the chairman of the Jewish Labour Committee in the United States, and also editor of The Forward, which is a paper which is still going today. It's the main paper, although it's only on the internet now, uh, in the United States. But then it was a Yiddish paper, and it was a Bundist paper. It wasn't a Zionist paper. And Vladek described how, quote, the whole organized labor movement in the progressive world are waging a fight against Hitler through the boycott. The transfer agreement scabs on that fight, unquote. And then he went on to say, the main purpose of the transfer is not to rescue Jews from Germany, but to strengthen various institutions in Palestine. And Vladek termed Palestine the official scab agent against boycott in the Near East. Of course, the Zionists themselves say, that the purpose of Havara was to rescue German Jews. But this is an absolute lie for a whole number of reasons. Firstly, in order to take advantage of Havara, you had to have a thousand pounds to enter Palestine because you avoided therefore the, the, the limited number of certificates the British were issuing. A thousand pounds then was what, 50, 60, 70,000 pounds a day. So that was something that was beyond the reach of most German Jews. It benefited the richest German Jews, the very people who in fact would have been able to find refuge in many, many other countries with that amount of capital. So the effect of Havara was not to save German Jews. That was the last thing, apart from the fact that no one at that point thought that German Jews needed rescuing. German Jews themselves wanted to stay in Germany. They believed that the ascent of Hitler was temporary. Uh, uh, and the Zionists above all thought that. Uh, as for it being used to ensure the immigration of Jews from Germany to Palestine, uh, that was simply not the case. In fact, between 1933 and 39, the Zionists tried to restrict as much as possible the immigration of German Jews. It was limited to about 22%. And Werner Senator, who was a member of the Jewish Agency Executive, warned uh, the German Zionist Federation that if the German Zionists, quote, did not improve the quality of the human material, unquote, that's how they refer to them, they were sending, the number of immigration certificates would be cut. But uh, there were other reasons as well. If Havara was a product of the desire to rescue the maximum number of Jews, uh, in danger, then it made no sense that nearly 5,000 American Jews and 20,000 other Jews from countries in Africa, Asia and elsewhere, where Jews were not under threat, were given certificates to enter Palestine between 1933 and 39. Uh, it simply makes no sense. Havara was agreed because uh, it, it, it uh, accorded with the needs of Zionism quite simply, and because they wanted to rescue not German Jews, but the capital and the wealth of German Jews. And that is extremely important. I'm now going to, because time is getting on, I'm going to uh, go on and talk about something called refugeeism. What was the attitude of the Zionists to the rescue of Jews from Germany and from Nazi-occupied Palestine, uh, occupied Europe. You might think, I mean, most Jews in the diaspora, in Britain and America and so on, did their best to ensure that Jews could escape to wherever they could find refuge, bearing in mind that the United States had extremely restrictive immigration quotas, Britain, uh, was not exactly sympathetic and so on. But the Zionists themselves 
had a policy, and, and that policy was quite simply this. They were opposed to the emigration of Jews from Nazi-occupied Europe or Nazi Germany to anywhere but Palestine. And the logic for this is quite simple, although it's still quite amazing. Their logic was Zionism was not set up in order to provide another refuge for Jews. That if Jews went to other places, they would simply replicate the anti-Semitism that had followed them. In addition, they argued that if Jews can find refuge from anti-Semitism elsewhere, what is the point of having a Jewish state? It was crucial to them that the refugee question be channeled through Zionist structures. That the only place of refuge, the only place that Jews should go was Palestine, even though Palestine could not absorb them. Indeed, the Zionists had very strict criteria. If you were old, if you were poor, if you didn't have the right trade, they would not give you a certificate. Uh, two thirds of German Jews who applied for certificates to enter Palestine were refused, even though uh, they could hand out thousand certificates to people who were not in any danger. And this became in particular a pressing issue after Kristallnacht, you remember in November 1938, when as a result of the assassination of von Rath, uh, the German uh, emissary in Paris uh, by uh, Herschel Grinchpan, uh, a German Jew whose parents had been expelled into the no man's land between Germany and Poland. Uh, the Nazi state, in the form of Goebbels in particular, organized uh, a pogrom uh, in which virtually all Jewish synagogues uh, were burnt to the ground. The windows of Jewish shops were smashed, hence the name Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass. Uh, and thousands of Jews were interned in concentration camps. I should add that those who were Zionists were released very quickly. And there was, uh, there was something called in Britain, the British government agreed to admit, and it was an exception, a one-off, they agreed to admit 10,000 Jewish children from Jewish, from Germany, from the greater uh, Germany. That included by then uh, Czechoslovakia or Bohemia, Moravia, and also Austria. What was the Zionist attitude to this? You might think they would welcome it, but if you did, you'd be wrong. The Zionists were bitterly opposed to bringing Jewish children from Germany to Britain. Their argument was, they should come to Palestine. In other words, they wanted to use the children as a battering ram to open the gates of Palestine. They, they were a weapon in the war uh, to increase immigration to Palestine, nothing more. And Ben-Gurion, in, in a famous quote, and it can be found in many places, not least uh, his, the authorized biography of him by Shabtai Tebeth, he said, if I knew, and I'm quoting, this is a, a memo uh, to the Mapai Central Committee, the Israeli Labour Party Central Committee of the 9th of December, 1938. He said, if I knew that it would be possible to save all the children in Germany by bringing them over to England and only half of them by transporting them to Eretz Yisrael, that is the land of Israel, then I would opt for the second alternative. For we must weigh not only the life of these children, but also the history of the people of Israel. In other words, setting up their bastard racial state was more important than the lives of 10,000 children. And Malcolm MacDonald, who was the colonial secretary at the time, uh, recalled, uh, quote, I remember at the time that Weizmann's attitude shocked me. He insisted on the children going to Palestine. As far as he was concerned, it was Palestine or nowhere. And that's contained in the, in the book, The Palestine Triangle by Lord Nicholas Bethel, if you want to look it up. And Yechai Amovites, in an essay, Jewish Refugees and Zionist Policy, uh, wrote that the Zionist leadership's great fear was that the future and destiny of Palestine and the plight of European Jewry would be considered as two separate problems. 
As a result, efforts would be made to solve the problem of European Jewry without using Palestine as a refuge. And Jechem Weitz, who is a very well-known writer, uh, was absolutely correct. The Zionist leadership was insistent that uh, was insistently opposed to the idea of refugeeism, saving Jews for the sake of saving them. The saving Jews must must be channeled into Zionist into a Zionist direction, that is Palestine. The two must not be separated. And Ben Gurion. Uh, uh, said uh, to the Mapai Council, and this is quoted in his biography by Shabtai Tevit, The Running Ground, uh, in his last chapter on the Holocaust, the tasks and assistance of saving one more Jew, of doing all to prevent deportations are very important and must be assumed by another organization to be set up and funded from other sources. Jewish agency, funds could only be used for rescue to Palestine. In other words, they simply weren't interested in rescue to anywhere else. Because, and I, again I quote, and this time I quote from Tom Segev, uh, in a, a really excellent book, it's, Tom Segev is an Israeli historian, he's also a journalist in Haaretz, and he wrote in this book, for Ben-Gurion, quote, it is a job of Zionism, not to save the remnant of Israel in Europe, but rather to save the land of Israel for the Jewish people. And Saul Friedlander, who was himself a Holocaust survivor and also uh, a Zionist historian, concluded that rescue of the Jews in Europe was not at the top of the issue. That's the Jewish community in Palestine's leaders' list of priorities. For them, the most important thing was the effort to establish a state. And just in case you're not convinced, uh, I also quote from Abihilel Silver, who was the president of the Zionist Organization of America, who was extremely worried, uh, and again I quote, it is possible for the diaspora, that is Jews living outside Palestine, to undermine the Jewish state because the urgency of the rescue issue could lead the world to accept a temporary solution. We should place increased emphasis on fundamental Zionist ideology. And so it was no surprise, no surprise when a conference was called by Roosevelt in June 1938, the Avion Conference. It was a conference, a face-saving conference in many ways for Western leaders to discuss a solution to the Jewish refugee problem, which was becoming increasingly apparent because anti-Semitism was increasing in Nazi Germany. But the Zionists were extremely hostile to this conference. Why? Because Palestine was not on the agenda. Uh, and I quote from Yitzhak Greenborn, who was a member of the Zionist executive. He was made chair of the Zionist Rescue Committee, the Jewish Agency Rescue Committee, in 1943, when he said immense dangers loom from the Evian conference. It could mark the end of Palestine as a land of immigration. They will find some new territory to which they will want to direct Jewish emigration. We must defend the principle that Jewish settlement can succeed only in Eretz Yisrael, and therefore no other settlement is possible. For Ben-Gurion, uh, he described the main task as to reduce the damage, danger, and disaster that can be uh, expected from Evian. And he said, he went on to say, the more we highlight the terrible distress of the Jewish masses in Germany, Poland, and Romania, the more damage we will do at this time to the negotiations with Britain. No government will come out against Britain for us. In my opinion, we should play down the image of the conference. As far as it depends on us, it is desirable the conference not make decisions on its own. And in the memo to the Jewish Agency executive on the 17th of December, uh, this was the day when the, when the Allied nations announced that the Holocaust was actually taking place, uh, he wrote, sorry, the memo of 17th of December 1938, I'm referring to thinking of 17th of December 1942. Ben-Gurion wrote, if the Jews are faced with a choice between the refugee problem and rescuing Jews from concentration camps on the one hand, and aid for the National Museum in Palestine on the other, the Jewish sense of pity will prevail, and our people's entire strength will be directed at aid for the refugees in the various countries. 
Zionism will vanish from the agenda. And indeed, not only world public opinion in England and America, but also from Jewish public opinion. We're risking Zionism's very existence if we allow the refugee problem to be separated from the Palestine problem. Now, you might think uh, <laughs> that the question of the Jewish refugees and escaping from Nazi-occupied Europe or Nazi, Nazi Germany, as it was then, uh, would be actually the major question. But the question of Palestine was a minor uh, affair at best. But for the Zionists, building the state was the issue over and above what happened to the Jews of Europe. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that's incredibly uh, important uh, to know. Uh, and George Lander, who's director of the Jewish Agency's Central Bureau for the Settlement, of German Jews wrote of the, his concern. He said, even if the conference will not place countries other than Palestine in the front for Jewish immigration, there will certainly be public appeals which will tend to overshadow the importance of Palestine. It may bind Jewish organizations to collect large sums of money for assisting Jewish refugees. And these collections are likely to interfere with our own uh, campaigns. Uh, I think I probably said enough. 40 minutes gone now, Tony. Sorry? 40 minutes gone now. You're doing okay. Okay, fine. Uh, I just want to touch fairly briefly on the Kastner affair. Rudolf Kastner was the leader of Hungarian Jewry, uh, Hungarian Zionism, rather. Zionism, of course, was a minority amongst Hungarian Jews. Up to March, up to 1944, Hungarian Jewry was the last major Jewish community which had been spared from the Holocaust. Hungary was anti-Semitic. It had a pro-Nazi leader. It was in alliance with the Nazis. It was ruled by Admiral Horthy, who was described by Israel's best friend today, the Prime Minister Viktor Orban, as an exceptional statesman. But up, up to 1944, Hungary, which hadn't been occupied by the by the Nazis, very much like Romania. So in Romania, half the Jews were exterminated or died, half survived, 300,000. It was an extremely anti-Semitic country. In Hungary, the million strong Jewish community had largely been untouched. And that's important to understand. But Hungary had been making peace feelers to the allies because it realized that most people except Hitler did that the Nazis were losing, were going to lose the world war. Uh, and Hitler summoned Horthy uh, to his headquarters in, in March, uh, March uh, 1944 uh, and laid down the law. This was the second summons he'd had. He'd had one, one earlier, one year earlier when he was asked why uh, Hungary's Jews had, had been spared. On his way back, uh, to Hungary, Admiral Horthy, his train, uh, had an attachment, another railway carriage. Edmund Wiesenmayer was in it. Uh, he was to become the new plenipotentiary of Hungary. And in fact, uh, on the 17th of March, I think it is, Nazi Germany invaded Hungary to ensure that it did not drop out of the alliance. Remember, when Italy uh, started making peace feelers and reached an agreement after the overthrow of Mussolini in 1943, I think it was October, September 43, again, uh, the SS attacked immediately. The same happened with Hungary. And immediately, the Nazis proceeded to implement the final solution. S soon on the scene was Adolf Eichmann, with about 200 of his Yidden commando. Uh, the second in command was uh, Hermann Kruny. Now, given that most of Hungary's Jews were assimilated, dispersed, they weren't living in ghettos and so on, it would have been extremely difficult to round them up. But what happened was that Eichmann reached an agreement with Rudolf Kastner, the leader of Hungarian Jewry, basically that a train would be allowed out of, German, out of Hungary with the Zionist leadership and various Jewish notables. It was originally 600 people, but it became about 1,600 people. In exchange for their acquiescence, silence, and even misinformation to the Jews of, of Hungary as to their destination. 
Uh, maybe I, I, I give you a slight detour as well to give you an example of the perfidy of Kastner. On April the 10th, two Jews escaped. There were, I think, there were one, there were five Jewish escapes from Auschwitz. And these two Jews, uh, they were the second escape. In fact, Rudolf Verber and Alfred, Alfred Wetzler. Uh, it was a perilous escape. Uh, they would have been hanged immediately if they'd failed. Uh, they left on the 10th of April and they arrived in Slovakia on the 24th of April. On the 25th of April, they set down what they knew and Verber had a, a photographic memory. He could remember all the transport. He could, he and Wetzler drew the diagrams of where the gas chambers, the crematoria and so on were, including the ramp that led, a special ramp had been built straight up to the gas chambers in order to accommodate the uh, influx that was expected of Hungary's Jews. They escaped, they wrote what was called the Auschwitz Report or the Auschwitz Protocols of which it is part. And uh, this was conducted under the supervision of the Slovakian Jewish Council. And sometime at the end of uh, April, uh, the 27th or 28th of April, Rudolf Kastner arrived in uh, Bratislava uh, and was given a copy of the protocols. And he decided basically that uh, he would not distribute them. He would keep them quiet. If Hungary's Jews had known of what befell them, they would not have got onto the trains uh, to Auschwitz. And of that, there is absolutely uh, no doubt. And um, if I can find... I'm gonna just have a look, sorry for one or two quotes if I can. Uh, This is quite an important uh... Eli Wiesel was one of those who was deported. Uh, from Hungary, he's uh, he was uh, he was deported to Auschwitz, and unlike his father, uh, he survived and he became a leading Zionist uh, ideologue. Uh, so there's no question about it. But on what happened in in Hungary, he was quite clear. He's he described how their maid Maria came to them sobbing. She begged us to come with her to a village where she had prepared a safe shelter. And this was true of many Jews in Hungary. Again, I'm just trying to, uh, he said, uh, Wiesel said uh, in his book, The Night, why didn't we know? To this day, I try to understand what happened. If ever there was a tragedy that could have been prevented, it was that one. Late in the war, when Nazi Germany was under immense pressure from Russia, uh, they were able to carry out the deportation of over 400,000 Jews from Hungary. And the major reason was, uh, was the Jewish agency and Kastner, who was the representative uh, of uh, the Jewish agency in Hungary. But the story doesn't end there. Kastner became a senior official in Israel after 1948. In fact, he was on the list to be elected to the Knesset uh, for Mapai, the Israeli Labour Party. And he was accused by Malchiel Greenveld, a Hungarian uh, Jew, of uh, collaboration. Uh, and he, this was one of a number of allegations which had been made against him. He'd been cleared by the Jewish agency in 1948. Uh, Moshe Krauss was also a Zionist representative in Budapest alleged that he, he had colluded with the Nazis. The and there was a trial, a libel trial. Chaim Cohen, who was the Attorney General, insisted that Kastner sue his accusers, Malchiel Greenville, for libel. And between 1954 and 1958, this trial uh, was undertaken. 
However, it didn't turn out quite as they expected. Kastner had gone to Nuremberg in 1947. He would established already in Hungary friendly relations with leading Nazi uh, Nazis such as Kurt Becher, who was Himmler's personal representative in Hungary. And after the war, he'd gone to Nuremberg and he testified in favor of these Nazis at Nuremberg on behalf of the Jewish agency, which partly paid his expenses. Uh, not only for Kurt Becher, who had been sent to strip Hungary's Jews of their wealth, but even more reprehensibly, uh, Hermann Krumi, who was Eichmann's second in charge. He, he, he had a, a, a most notable uh, uh, heritage, if you like, uh, a list of achievements uh, in Salonika, uh, in Slovakia, uh, elsewhere in uh, Europe of having deported Jews. And in Hungary, he was in charge of the nuts and bolts uh, of extermination. And despite this, Kastner testified uh, in Nure at Nuremberg and almost certainly saved him from the noose. It was only uh, in 1955 in Germany that the question was reopened when Rudolf Verber testified against him that he was sentenced uh, to life imprisonment. I say I've had to be very quick, but the, the Israeli court in 1955, found Kastner had collaborated. He'd lied on oath about his testimony. They only knew about his testimony from Kurt Becher. In fact, I, uh, in fact, Kastner had testified for seven leading Nazis in all, but that was enough. Although the verdict was overturned by the Supreme Court on legal grounds, they did not disturb the factual findings and agreed that in terms of testifying for Nazis, that. Uh, that Kastner had collaborated. That was in a sense uh, a bit irrelevant because by 1955, Kastner had been assassinated uh, by people who had very close links to Israel's Shin Bet, the, the secret service. And, it, and there's a battle now going on in the Israeli courts to release the files. It's an extremely interesting uh, assassination because it would appear that he was wounded in the assassination attempt and then murdered in the hospital to which he was taken uh, by Shin Bet itself. Uh, so there are thousands of files which they refused to release on security grounds and one can see why. I'll, I'll wind up very briefly uh, by saying this, that of course after the war, a number of different Zionists uh, had a sense of guilt and that uh, if I can quote just from Noah Lucas, who's a critical Zionist uh, historian in his Modern History of Israel, he said, and I'm quoting, a gnawing sense of guilt amongst Israel's leaders, asking, did the Jewish agency and other organizations do all that had been possible to save the Jews of Europe from extermination? Were the various wartime negotiations with the Nazi executives of death morally impeccable? Did the concentration on attaining statehood itself impede rescue? Did Zionist statecraft contribute to the toll of Jewish life? These and other questions were submerged in the unconscious mind of the nation. From time to time, they came to the surface, demanding precise elucidation in the courts of law, as in the Kastner case. Uh, I will leave it uh, there, uh, except uh, I'll give you a final quote, which I think really sums this up, and it's from David Ben-Gurion, who was a, is the second longest serving prime minister of Israel and its first prime minister. And he is quoted again in Shaddai Tevez uh, biography. It's not official, he is the official biographer. Ben-Gurion warned, Zionism is not primarily engaged in saving individuals. If along the way it saves a few thousand, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, thousands of individuals, so much the better. But in the event of a conflict of interest between saving individual Jews and the good of the Zionist enterprise, we shall say the enterprise comes first. And that was a speech to the Mapai Council in 1933. And I think really that sums up the Zionist attitude during the Holocaust. Uh, I, I don't have time, but during the Holocaust itself, the Zionists often denied that there was a Holocaust taking place. They played it down immensely. And indeed, they quoted from Nazi denials uh, in the Palestine papers. But I, say, I don't have time, unfortunately, to go through all of that. But just to 
to say that the Zionist obsession and quoting of the Holocaust today is in marked contrast to what happened when the Holocaust was taking place. Then the Zionist movement basically did not want to know what was happening in Europe. And that is why they are so afraid and so angry when people like Ken Livingston touch on the subject, because it's something they know in their hearts they cannot defend. Okay, thank you very much. I've gone on far, far too long, but thank you for your toleration. All right, thanks, uh, Tony. Um, I've got a, a number of questions, and I'm, I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, give you a few minutes break. I think that after that, you uh, you probably need a few moments to uh, get your breath back, and also have to have a quick drink, I should think. Yeah. Um, a number of uh, a number of questions uh, that have come in, um, and I'll just read them out. Um, this one's from Victor Logan. There are a couple from uh, from Victor actually. Victor says, uh, "Is it true that the Ashkenazi Jews have no more biblical or historical claim to land in Palestine than the British had to India?" And, it's, and then he also goes on. Is it also true that the only Jews with any credible biblical and historical claim in Palestine are the Sephardic Jews? And uh, I think I touch on some of that question in one of the first sessions, but it is an important one um, because so much of the claims of Zionism do rest uh, upon that idea. Um, and it's obviously a controversial one. I think the work of Shlomo Sand uh, yeah. raised some of those issues. Um, Victor also says um, that it's ironic that Sephardic Jews are effectively second-class citizens, um, albeit better off than the Palestinians, Arab Palestinians, um, in, in their historical biblical state. Um, now, so just move on. Um, this one's from Michael Craig, and uh, Michael says, that the, uh, the, the Nazis lumped all Jews together and labeled them as the enemies of Germany. And he talks about uh, the Nazis' twisted logic that the Jews were bankers who wrecked the economy. On the other hand, they were also communists, okay? So he so said, this is of course a contradiction, but do you think that Zionism, that the Zionists claim that the Jews were a nation helped to strengthen this particular uh, Nazi logic? Uh, okay. Um, okay, uh, one from Mary Dwyer. Uh, she says, um, which I think probably links to the kinder transport question, but it, it may be linked to wider issues in the Second World War. Um, didn't Churchill refuse to allow Jewish children to seek refuge here? And um, wasn't he alerted to the problem by an unlikely source? And I, I don't know if Mary is asking about information about what was going on in Nazi-occupied Europe. So um, if, if, if it's, it's primarily about that, maybe you can, you can talk about it, uh, Tony. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, um, a couple of, uh, another question comes in, um, really about a contradiction in the Zionist policy that you referred to, Tony, where um, the Zionists, uh, on the other hand, uh, on one hand, only want people, only want Jew the Jewish populations to go to Palestine, go to Israel. But on the other hand, putting up restrictions and, um, you know, the, the, the 1,000 uh, pounds that you mentioned. So I wonder if you could perhaps talk about that contradiction. Again, I know that you've referred to this before, that uh, only certain sorts of Jews were going to be deemed worthy to enter um, the, the, the new uh, the new Zionist state, but I wonder if you could perhaps sort of draw on that. It, it did come up in the um, did come up in the question. Sorry, there. what was the contradiction that you? Well, the contradiction was between the idea that uh, that that Jews should only go to Palestine or go to Israel, but then uh, putting um, a one thousand pound sort of entry ticket on that, the documentation to get in. This was a, a, a point that was made in the in the questions there. Um, okay, I'll just uh, scroll on down there. Um, okay, this is uh, from anonymous attendee. I would prefer people's names, but um, I'll, I will you know, read it. Um, 
Would it be correct to infer that the predominant commitment of the Zionist movement was settlement and establishing a political presence in Israel, almost irrespective of the actual conditions of Jews in Europe, in particular Germany? And this goes back to something which I think you dealt with again in an earlier session, Tony, about the idea of place of refuge and, um, uh, you know, that sort of uh, idea. And um, it, uh, you've got quite a few questions coming up. I think what I'll do, actually, is I'll, uh, I'll let you answer the ones we've got so far, then I'll come back. And I'll, um, I've also got um, somebody who wants to come in and ask a question. So what I'll do is I'll bring in Paddy O'Keefe now, and he can ask his question, and then you can respond to Paddy oh. on the ones we've done so far. Okay, yep. Paddy, if you'd uh, just like to come in now, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I don't have a question. I'm just in awe of Tony's knowledge and erudition. Uh, I just thought it was a wonderful exposition that he, um, uh, that he gave us this evening. Uh, well done, Tony. Well, That's all I've got to say. Paddy. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure Paddy, he'll, he'll like that. He prefers questions like that. If there are any more, I'm sure he'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> They're easier to deal with, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, um, I'll, if you'd like to go over those few questions I've dealt with, uh, Tony, then I'll take in a couple more that I've got in the, in the panellist list. Yeah, the first one about Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardic Jews. Uh, I actually... The question was, do Ashkenazi Jews have any claim to Israel as opposed to Sephardic Jews? I would actually say that neither Sephardic nor Ashkenazi Jews have any claim to uh, live in Israel by virtue of the fact that their ancestors may have lived in the land of Canaan, Palestine, whatever you want to call it, uh, 2,000 or more years ago. I mean, it, I think I mentioned in the previous talk that, you know, the idea that I could walk up to someone's house because I like it and then say, well, my ancestors lived here 2000 years ago. I lay my claim. Would you mind packing your bags and leaving? Because that, in essence, was what the Zionist claim amounted to. It really does not matter. This is a kind of racial mystification that Ashkenazi Jews, by virtue of their religion and their alleged DNA, I presume, association uh, with the inhabitants of Palestine have some kind of valid claim. They don't. It, it's immaterial whether, say, my ancestors at about 50 generations removed uh, lived in Palestine. It, it, it's completely irrelevant today. No group of people can go to someone else's country and say that, well, we lived here before, therefore, could you move out? Zionism was a settler colonial. A movement. Uh, it colonized Palestine on the basis that Palestine was a land without a people for a people without a land. As it happens, and not just Shalomo Sands, but also Arthur Kestler in his book, The 13th Tribe, demonstrated that Jews in Europe almost certainly originate from, for example, uh, the Khazars, a nation, a country that existed between uh, the Caspian and the Black Sea at uh, some time around the 11th, 12th century. Uh, and that it's extremely unlikely in any event that European Jews had any biological connection with Palestine. As for the Sephardic Jews, well, they were living in all the countries uh, of the Middle East, Yemen, Iraq. Iraq was the oldest Jewish community in the world, two and a half thousand years old. The Zionists helped destroy it in order that they could provide Israel with a Jewish working class. Egypt had a large Jewish community. Morocco, virtually every country uh, had Jews who were living in relative harmony uh, with the surrounding Arabs. They were considered people of the book. Uh, although there were some differences with them, there was nothing like the anti-Semitism that occurred in Europe. The early Zionist and Arthur Rupin, who was the director of the Palestine office from 1908, uh, who was, a believer in the racial sciences. He, he wanted to become a kind of German nationalist and he was most affronted uh, that despite the fact that he was completely reactionary, he was anti-Semitic and he was proud of it, they wouldn't accept him because he was Jewish. 
Uh, and so he came, when he came to Palestine and he, he was responsible for the Palestine office, uh, he had an attitude to Sephardic Jews, which was that they were Semites and therefore didn't belong in, in Palestine. He had this uh, absurd belief that the original Jews of Palestine were Indo-Germanic, in essence, uh, Aryans. Uh, and although he brought Yemeni Jews over to, uh, to Palestine to do the hard work, he engaged in what, what Etten Bloom called pathological stereotyping. They were given starvation wages, provided with no medical attention, and between 1912 and 1918, almost 50% of them died as a result of the racist attitude of Rupin to the Sephardic Jews. And, and this persisted. I mean, it, there's a scandal which is ongoing in Israel that the Yemeni Jews who came to Israel, primarily Yemeni Jews, in the early 50s, thousands of their babies were simply stolen from them. They were given either to American Jewish couples or Ashkenazi Jewish couples in order that, in essence, they could be de-Arabized because that was the fear of Ben-Gurion and the Israeli Labour Party, that Arab culture would seep in to their wonderful uh, new uh, uh, state. Uh, so, I mean, that was the attitude of the Zionists to the Sephardi Jews, but the Sephardi Jews had no greater claim than anyone else. Uh, they, were, they were also settled co uh, colonials, although they came most unwillingly. Uh, the Zionist claim uh, reinforced the Nazi claims that Jews were bankers and so on and so forth. Well, Yes, I mean, the Zionists had this idea that the Jews had brought anti-Semitism on, on themselves because they, their occupational structure was, in the words of uh, Barachov, the so-called Marxist Zionist, was like an inverted pyramid. Too many rich Jews at the top of this pyramid and not enough workers at the bottom. And the aim of Zionism was to invert that pyramid, to create a normal social economic structure. And that could only be done on Jewish national soil, where you would have a wholly Jewish society, which would then divide into classes in the normal way. But when they were in Europe, Jews became exploiters. This was, this was the ideology of the Zionists as to why Jews were not part of the host nations. And of course, uh, this played into a, uh, the hands of the, the Nazis. I've quoted Alfred Rosenberg, the Nazi's uh, main theoretician. Uh, the Zionists were validating everything the Nazi said. They were justifying it. So yes, that is right. Incidentally, I mean, there were relatively few Jewish bankers in Germany. The main, the main uh, uh, professions were things like lawyers. Uh, and uh, the Jews predominantly owned big department stores and so on. So there was an economic competition uh, with small shopkeepers who felt who were the base of the Nazi party. There is no doubt there was a socio-economic reason uh, for why the Nazis uh, gained that base. But I have to say, although today we think of uh, Germany as being an anti-Semitic nation and anti-Semitism was the main driver of the Nazis, this is simply not true. Between 1930 and 33, the Nazis hardly mentioned the Jews or, or engaged in anti-Semitism. It was a subject they steered clear of. Their main attack was on the labor movement, the Communist Party and the Social Democrat Party. And of course, the first thing they did when they gained power in March, well, January, but then they were, uh, they uh, through the burning of the Reichstag, they had the enabling act uh, and then they won in an unfree election in, on March the 7th, 44% uh, of the votes and with the Conservative and Centre Party, a majority. At that time, their main enemy was the Labour movement and the first concentration camp that was open was Dachau uh, in Bavaria. And the people who were sent there were not Jews unless they happened to be Jewish communists or Jewish socialists. They were workers and representatives of the workers' aid organizations. And for most of the period uh, uh, between 1933 and 1939, the main concentration of the Nazis, the main target of the Nazis was the communist resistance in particular. It wasn't the Jewish organizations, although repression of course increased substantially on the Jews, uh, on the Jews as a result. The main 
harbors of anti-Semitism in the Nazi party were to be found in the SS and the SA in particular. In fact, it could be argued that anti-Semitism resided predominantly in what Hitler called the old fighters, the, the people who brawled in the beer halls of Munich uh, with him against the communists and who formed part of the Freikorps. The majority of the Nazi party, especially those who joined after 1933, were not anti-Semitic in any uh, real sense. Uh, it was a hard core uh, of the Nazi party, the anti-capitalists, if you like, because the Jews were the representatives of capitalism. There was a kind of uh, anti-capitalism of sorts amongst the brown shirts, uh, and the Jews represented the capitalism. It was a false anti-capitalism. Just ask, in Palestine, the class struggle for the labor Zionists was not against the employers who happened to be Jewish. It was the Arabs. The Arabs were the class enemy. So they transformed the national to a racial uh, struggle. Uh, and I, I've already dealt with that in my talk on socialist Zionism, so I won't go into that any further. Uh, Mary Dwyer asks uh, a very good question about the kinder transport, uh, which I've already mentioned. He ask, asks, did Churchill refuse to allow the Jews uh, to enter here? And the answer is no, it wasn't primarily Churchill. The person primarily responsible for refusing to allow German, to, to allow Jewish refugees into Britain during the war was a Labour Party politician by the name of Herbert Morrison, who was the coalition Home Office Minister. And he set his face against the entry of Jewish refugees on the grounds that it would increase anti-Semitism. That was the bogus pretext. The Zionists who controlled the Board of Deputies had absolutely no quarrel with him. And that really puts into perspective the so-called anti-Semitism campaign and affair in the Labour Party today. When there were actual anti-Semites in the Labour Party, like Herbert Morrison, and Morrison was both a Zionist and an anti-Semite, then it had real consequences. Morrison refused to allow, for example, 2,000 Jewish children in Vichy, France, who could have entered Britain to enter because he was absolutely opposed to anything but a small number coming into this country. Those children and 500 Luxembourg uh, Jews and, uh, and many others were deported to Auschwitz as a result. So you could say that there was a time when anti-Semitism in the Labour Party had fatal consequences and it wasn't under Jeremy Corbyn. It was under the, the, uh, the uncle, I think it is, of Peter Mandelson, uh, Herbert Morrison, the right-wing uh, Home Secretary in the coalition government. Uh, the idea that Jews only go to Palestine, selectivity, etc. First, can I just clarify, the thousand pounds necessary to get into Palestine without a certificate was a British imposition. It wasn't a Zionist imposition. The British said only so many can come in. At first, it was, of course, very generous and virtually anybody the Zionists wanted to come in did come in. But as a result of the Arab revolt and the Arab general strike between 1936 and 39, the longest general strike in history, incidentally, we don't hear much of it now, the British were forced to issue in 1939 a white paper when they knew they were facing the possibility of a world war with Germany. And they didn't want to have to use British troops to keep the Arabs down in Palestine whilst they were fighting Hitler. So they took a decision, which was basically to drastically limit Jewish emigration, immigration to Palestine. It was set at 15,000 a year for five years. And the Zionists rose up in the uproar uh, at this. Ben-Gurion said they would fight the white paper as if there was no war, and they would fight the war as if there was no white paper. Uh, and that was the situation. But the Zionists had always, under Arthur Rupin, been quite deliberate in terms of who could enter Palestine. It was a policy of selectivity. And 80% of those who wanted to go, from Poland mainly, were refused because they were poor, they had no, no skills employment-wise and so on and so forth. Uh, they were old. They didn't have assets, etc. But someone with a thousand pounds 
was clearly someone with substantial capital in those days, and they were welcomed, and the British exempt, exempted them. They were capitalist immigrants uh, and were treated as such, but it wasn't a Zionist uh, qualification. It, it was, uh, but the British uh, did that. So I think I've answered all the questions to date, but uh, if I'm wrong, then you will remind me. Okay, thanks, Tony. Um, I've got a, I've got a, I've got two people who want to come in from the floor, and then there are also some other questions I've noted down from both the chat and the question box, which I'll, I'll deal with in a, in a moment. Okay, uh, could I ask uh, Caroline O'Reilly, please, to come in now? Hello, Caroline. Could you unmute, please? Have I unmuted? Yeah, can you hear me? We, yeah, we can hear you. Yes, go yeah, ahead. Fantastic talk, Tony, as usual. I was very in, interested about this Rudolf. Did you call him Kastner? Was yeah, K-A-S-Z-T-N-E-R. Oh, Kastner. Yeah, w w what I wanted to know was why this group you talked about who, was, who tried to, who did assassinate him, who were they and why, I mean, obviously it was pretty vile, but why did they assassinate, why did they assassinate him? <laughs> I know he was vile, they wanted to get rid of him, but who were they? Uh, well, one, well, one of their names is... Uh, we'll take a couple of questions. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah. Who okay. were the assassins of Kastner? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, Faraz, please. Okay. Yeah, we, 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 we can hear you, Faraz. Sorry, Faraz, you're muted again. All right. Um, uh, the undergraduate courses in history, modern history in uh, Great Britain, are they biased or not, to your knowledge? OK, thanks, Faraz. Um, OK, a, a, couple of, um, a couple of questions from the chat that I've managed to pick up. Uh, Kevin, I'm... Felicity. Okay, right. Sorry, she's not on the panel at the moment. She is there. She's, oh, yes, yeah, she is now. Okay, Felicity, can you come, please? Hi, yes. Um, I have a question, and I've got a couple of anecdotes uh, just supporting things that have been said. Um, I can remember when I was a child at the end of the 60s, and I was taken by my father to Israel, and there were two things that stood out in my mind. One was that you could buy bacon in a shop. And I was told that in Israel you couldn't buy bacon. And two, that Arabs were distinctly second-class citizens. They were treated with a, with a lot of animosity as well by Ashkenazi. And I, I was an Ashkenazi Jew. Um, that's number one, my anecdote. Uh, second anecdote, I've had um, biologically or genetically, I'm 100% European, so, which answers the claim that do Jews have a right to Israel because that's where they come from well if I'm 100% European then it doesn't make sense so that but that's not my question my question is um do you think that the tactics of the early Zionists or the Zionists in the 30s and the 40s can be can be evidenced today by the Zionists in the whole conflict between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, or to what extent do you think it's it's mirrored? Thanks. Okay, thank you, um, Felicity, and uh, nice to see a picture of Rosa Luxemburg on your fridge. <laughs> um, a couple of uh, questions now from the um, from the sort of question and answer panel. Um, this one is. Um, from John Beeching, which is an interesting question, and I hope I'm sure Tony knows a lot about this one. And it's um, John says, did any of the Zionist groups in occupied Europe take part in resistance? And maybe as a sort of corollary to that, Tony, you might like to talk about the nature of um, Jewish resistance uh, to the uh, to the Nazis, and, and indeed who carried that out. But the role of Nazis uh, in that. Um, there, um, there's, there's a question here, which I, I'll ask, but I mean, it's an interesting one. Um, 
Is it true or isn't it true that the DNA of present day Palestinians is closest to those of the ancient Hebrews? And I think we've had this discussion on DNA and so on before, but I'll let, uh, I'll let Tony uh, talk about that. And also about uh, how the Jews were described uh, at the time of Jesus, in other words, in the, you know, the, the first century common era. Um, what were, were they referred to as Jews? Again, how were they described? I think there's a, obviously uh, Jack is quite interested in that, um, you know, that, that theme. Um, another question, which is historical, but it does obviously relate to the issue of anti-Semitism in Germany. And uh, given the fact that uh, today is the anniversary of Martin Luther's appearance before Charles V at the Diet of Worms, um, it's quite appropriate. Um, uh, Comrade asked whether um, and the sort of Luther, Luther's anti-Semitism uh, was an element and indeed the legacy of anti-Semitism that comes from Lutheranism and uh, was that exploited by the Nazis and you know how important was that and I suppose it's a wider a wider question about well, I didn't quite get that can you just repeat it so, uh, yeah. Evan. yeah sorry um it's a it's a question about anti-Semitism in Germany and about Luther's legacy uh whether the Nazis exploited that legacy uh, in in developing their anti-Semitism. So it's probably about wider German anti-Semitism. And uh, one last question for me, Tony, which I will just usurp my uh, position. Um, it's actually about the Zionist assessment of the Nazis. Um, and you talk about, uh, um, about Kessner's visits to uh, Bratislava and, and, and uh, obviously, um, you know, his collaboration in this way. But I wondered if you could um, perhaps indicate how seriously the Nazis, uh, sorry, the Zionists took the Nazi threat. I know this is linked to the much wider question, uh, which sort of lurks behind a lot of the debate between the so-called intentionalists and accidentalists and so on, and the reasons why and how and why the Nazis carried out their particular program at a particular time in a particular way. But I'm interested whether Zionists had a, a sort of understanding uh, that was equivalent or indeed greater than other peoples about the, what the aims of the Nazis actually were. You, you've told us about how they might have exploited that, but I wondered if there is, if they, you know, had a particular assessment of that. Okay. Um, there isn't anybody else, I think, for asking a question at the moment. So. I think what I'll do, since it's half seven and there's quite a few questions, um, I'll let you answer them and more or less do a summing up. Okay, you've worked very hard this evening, so. Uh, <laughs> okay, so off you go. Okay, uh, I was just going to deal with the last question first. Uh, I, I have, just give me one second. Uh, What was, uh, I'll deal with your question first. What was the Zionist assessment of the Nazis? Well, I think many of them had a different assessment. Ben Gurion claims that uh, a service 1933, he read Mein Kampf and came to the conclusion that Hitler's program was for the extermination of the Jews. However, there's very little evidence for that. And it's, I think a post hoc, a post facto uh, look at uh, the situation. I've already said that when Hitler came to power, the Zionists were the only element in the Jewish community, apart from in Germany, a very far right sliver of German Jewish opinion, German nationalists uh, who welcomed Hitler but hoped that he'd be weaned off his anti Semitism. But that was, of course, uh, a, a nonsense. To most Zionists, certainly the Zionist leadership, Hitler was a continuation of traditional anti-Semitism. They didn't see that anti-Semitism combined with fascism, racial anti-Semitism of a fascist nature could, could prove uh, exterminatory. I mean, Trotsky did for certain, 
but uh, relatively few others did. And indeed, I mean, I, I can quote, and I'm, I'm going to go to some notes. Burl Katznelson, who was a founder of MAPI, which was the Israeli Labour Party, editor of Davar, which was a history newspaper, and effectively Ben Gurion's deputy, saw the rise of Hitler as, and I quote, an opportunity to build and flourish like none we have ever had or ever will have. Uh, and that's, uh, you can find that in Tom Segev's book, The Seventh Million, uh, and also in Francis Nicosia's book, Zionism and Antisemitism in Nazi Germany. Actually, Ben Gurion was more optimistic. He said the Nazis' victory would become a fertile force for Zionism. And I've already quoted, uh, I mean, Joachim Prinz, uh, about how the Nazis asked for a more Zionist behavior. And I've quoted Emma Ludwig that it will be forgotten, but he will have a beautiful monument in Palestine. And Bialik said that perhaps Hitler has saved German Jewry, which was being assimilated into annihilation. I mean, I'm sure they would all be embarrassed to, today if they were alive uh, at how it turned out. But the Zionists were extremely complacent. They, to be quite honest, they didn't really care. They, they saw that uh, the advent of Hitler meant the defeat of assimilation. For Zionism, assimilation is the worst enemy. I mean, today, still, many Zionists compare the assimilation of Jews uh, to non-Jews, like, as in Britain and in the United States, where marriage between Jews and non-Jews is over 50%. They compare that the loss, which what they term the loss of those Jews, to the loss of Jews in the Holocaust. Just as many Zionists and the former chief rabbi Jacobovitz compared abortion for Jewish women to the Holocaust, because in both cases it was a loss of Jews. Such ideas are part of a racial construct of humanity. You see humanity as comprising different races of which the Jews are a part. And uh, it doesn't matter whether Hitler killed them in the gas chamber or the doctor killed them in the abortion uh, ward or, or, or whatever. It was still a disappearance of the Jewish folk, to be quite honest. So that is their mentality. Uh, and that was uh, the Zionist attitude. Uh, I, there's a number of different uh, questions. I'll try and go through them. But if anyone uh, does have thinks I haven't answered it fully or written down my notes fully, uh, then please uh, come back at me. Kastner's, Kastner was assassinated, I think it was 1955. Uh, he was shot by Zev Eckstein and one other person who had had very close links to Mossad. Uh, it was argued they were really agents of it. They were sentenced to prison, uh, life imprisonment, but they were released after five years. There is a lot of information. There's an Israeli historian who's been doing a lot of research and he obtained the medical records of Kastner, who was taken, I think, to the Hadassah uh, University Hospital in Jerusalem. And it would appear that Kastner was not fatally wounded. He was recovering from his wounds. And in essence, someone entered his ward and basically smothered him with a pillow. He was actually killed. There's a whole number, thousands of files, which Shin Bet are hanging on to. And there's a court case in Israel now uh, going on. Uh, and this historian is arguing that the record should be released because there's no security reason. I mean, in Israel, every excuse for why you can't release an archive is its security. And judges usually defer to such arguments. We'll see if the High Court does it in this case. I suspect they will because it will prove extremely embarrassing. But there is no doubt in my eyes that Kastner was probably murdered by Shin Bet or its operatives actually in the hospital itself. That has to be the assumption, uh, given the evidence that's been collected so far. Uh, but why was he assassinated? He, he was a complete embarrassment. He knew where the bodies were buried. He knew what the Jewish agency had been doing. Uh, they certainly didn't want him to roam free trying to clear his name at other people's expense. The Jewish agency, Elia Domkin, testified that uh, they'd never heard of Kurt Becher. He was a Waffen, uh, uh, he was an SS colonel and I say Himmler's emissary. 
uh, and he'd given evidence for him. And he'd said he'd told the Jewish agency what he was doing and they agreed. Dobkin, who was one of those who apparently agreed, said he'd never even heard the name of Becher, but uh, there is uh, other evidence that he was lying on oath, basically. And uh, that is the opinion of Chaim Cohen, who was uh, the attorney general who was prosecuting. So uh, there were very good reasons to have him out of the way. I should add that Yad Vashem, the Israelis, Israel's Holocaust Propaganda Museum in Jerusalem, has rehabilitated Kastner, despite the evidence against him. There's no doubt. For instance, in Kolosvar, Kaluj, which is now in Romania, uh, the 20,000 Jews there were deported to Auschwitz, apart from Kastner's family, which were left on the train out of Hungary to Switzerland via Bergen-Belsen. Uh, the Jews there were were reassured that the trains were going to a place, a fictitious place called Kenya Mays, not Auschwitz. They were deliberately misinformed by Kastner's uh, supporters. Uh, and, and this came out because a lot of Hungarian Holocaust survivors, people who had survived Auschwitz, testified in his trial. And they testified that they'd been deliberately misinformed by Kastner's henchmen. Uh, after all, uh, they reassured them, uh, not only reassured them they wouldn't go to Auschwitz, uh, but of course they, they didn't take the train themselves. They, they left on Kastner's train, so I, they clearly knew the truth. Uh, but there was a lot of stuff that Kastner could have come out with, and uh, I think uh, Mapai was desperate to have him silenced. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the cabinet committees which hasn't been released either. Mary Dw uh, Uh, can you eat bacon in Israel? Uh, <laughs> uh, it used to be the case that it, it was impossible to uh, source it, but uh, the kibbutzim of uh, Mapam, which is a, the left social Zi socialist Zionist uh, party, uh, who, were, who tended towards atheism, started rearing pigs on the kibbutzim, much to the annoyance and... Uh, aggravation of the orthodox sector which didn't want this so uh, pork meat is I think now in Israel uh, quite popular uh, but as to the Arabs being second-class citizens can I leave that really for my next and final talk next week uh, but the answer is yes of course they were uh, and still are second-class citizens it's a Jewish state and Arabs aren't Jewish therefore they're automatically second-class they can be no other. Uh, are the attitudes of Zionism in the 1930s uh, still current? Yes, I, I would say they are. The desire of Ben Gurion and the Israeli Labour Party, which don't forget, the revisionist Zionists were small. The, the Likud Zionists were a small minority. They were based around a terror group called Irgun uh, or the Stern Gang. Uh, it was the Israeli Labour Party which was responsible for the Zionist project, really, uh, from the early 1900s uh, until 1977. And they had, a, they believed in building a Jewish racial state, perpetuating the myth of the Jewish people. Uh, and so all the attitudes that they had in the 1930s about the fact that the building the state was more important than saving individual Jews because the state lasts forever. Human beings die off in any case, uh, are still current uh, without a doubt. I mean, I haven't even touched on the episode of Argentina uh, between 1976 and 83. There was the first anti-Semitic regime post World War II, and that was in Argentina under the generals who murdered about 3,000 Jews, although Jews are only less than 1% of the Argentinian population. They formed up to 12.5% of those who disappeared. Israel simply did not want to know. It, it was an overtly anti-Semitic regime. Uh, the most famous of those, uh, survive, those who were tortured, but he survived, was Jacob, Jacobo Timmerman, who emigrated to Israel and then emigrated back. Uh, when he fell out of favor because he, he opposed the Lebanese war in 1982. But Israel, when it came to genuine anti-Semitism, Israel simply did not want to know because it had a healthy 
military trading relationship with Argentina. It actually supplied the majority of weapons for Argentina in, in the Falklands War, for example. So when it comes to genuine anti-Semitism, whether it's in Argentina then, or in Hungary now with Viktor Orban and his campaign of George Soros, uh, Zionism in Israel does not want to know. So the anti-Semitism campaign in the Labour Party, we can understand it's completely and utterly fake and false. It's not about anti-Semitism and it never was about anti-Semitism. The Jewish resistance. Yes, Zionists certainly participated in the Jewish resistance, but they also uh, participated very heavily in the Jewish councils, which collaborated with the Nazis. Isaiah Trunk, who's compiled uh, an 800 page book on uh, the Jewish councils, the Yiddenrat, estimates that two thirds of the members of the Yiddenrat were Zionists. Uh, now, I, it, it's another topic entirely the Yiddenrat, uh, the Jewish councils, uh, but they were instruments of the Nazi occupiers. Very few of them resisted uh, and they enabled, in essence, the Holocaust in many cases uh, by rounding up the Jews themselves, not the Nazis. It, in some places, like and Warsaw is the prime example. Warsaw had the largest concentration of Jews in Europe, a ghetto of four to five hundred thousand. Uh, the Zionists ran the Yiddenrat uh, and it was hated by the Jews because it did the work of uh, the Nazis. It rounded up the poor Jews to supply the labor requirements of the Nazis. Uh, and the Yiddenrat taxed the, uh, the poorer Jews to feed the even poorer Jews. So uh, it was an abomination. Uh, so the first thing that the Jewish resistance, which was composed of both Zionists and anti-Zionist members of the Bund, which is the largest party in Poland before the war in 1938, they got over 60% of the Jewish vote for the council elections and 17 out of 20 council seats. The Bund led that resistance, but they did it with Hashem Hatzer, as I said, uh, and the communist uh, Jews and others who are unaffiliated. It, it's quite interesting because there was actually also the revisionist Zionists fought separately and they were better armed because their fascist friends in Poland had supplied them with machine guns, which uh, the Jewish resistance uh, led by the Buns and uh, the, uh, Hashem Hatzer did not have. And that was one of the critical things that they lacked was adequate weaponry for the Jewish resistance. So it was an extremely heroic struggle, but given the conditions that were in, uh, when they were fighting, the question of whether you were a Zionist or not was completely and utterly irrelevant. In fact, the Palestinian parties, which had never sent emissaries into the Warsaw Ghetto or into, into Poland. I mean, Palestine literally cut off uh, Nazi-occupied Europe, whereas the Bund in Poland sent emissaries in continuously. Uh, the Polish Home Army sent Jan Karski, uh, into the Warsaw Ghetto twice. He, he was also sent into Belzec, one of the first concentration extermination camps, uh, an extremely notorious camp, which killed 650,000 Jews, we think. Just four people survived out of that uh, number. Uh, the, but the Home Army sent him in and then publicized the report. The Zionists really did not want to know. Uh, during the Holocaust, to the Zionists, there was no Holocaust. Even when they came out on November the 23rd, 1942, and were forced to announce the existence of the Holocaust, they knew about it for three months and had sat, sat on it, they'd kept silent. Even when they did that, almost immediately afterwards, they then said, well, there are two million Polish Jews who are still alive. And what did they do? They quoted from uh, Ostland, a Nazi paper to that effect. In fact, by the end of 1942, virtually no Jews may be a couple of hundred thousand at best were left in Poland. Uh, Poland had 3.3 million Jews before the war. So uh, 1942 was the year when the vast majority of Polish Jews were exterminated. But the Zionists kept quiet, did not want to know, but they had very good listening sources in Europe, in Geneva in particular, uh, which was Switzerland was neutral. So they had very good sources about what was happening and they simply didn't in many cases, pass on that information. And then the US State Department and, uh, uh, sorry, I can't remember his name now, but the Assistant Secretary of State, oh yeah, Breckenridge Long, actually told the American consulate not to send them reports about what was happening. Breckenridge Long was extremely sympathetic to the Zionists 
uh, but he fought like mad to ensure that no one came into, uh, into the United States if he could help it. So there was Jewish resistance. Uh, Bialystok was uh, another place. Uh, Minsk, uh, which was, of course, near the Soviet Union, uh, uh, and was near the forest where partisans operated. There was actually what you call a fighting Yidden rat there. The Jewish Council actually became, in essence, the executive of the Jewish of the resistance. Uh, and so Mushkin, the, the leader of the Yidden rat, was uh, caught by the Nazis and summarily hanged. Uh, so there were occasions when a Yidden rat can convert itself into a, a, an arm of the resistance, but that was few and far between. It was usually where there were partisans operating in the forest nearby and they could establish relationships uh, with the Yudin rat. But uh, of course, uh, resistance was the exception, not the rule, because the Jews were unarmed. But this was the question that was asked at the Eichmann trial by the prosecutor, Gideon Hausner, who said, uh, why did you go like sheep to the slaughter? Well, the answer is obvious because they had nothing to fight the Nazis with. They, well, they weren't armed. It's the same with any population subject to genocide, whether in Cambodia, Rwanda, or whatever. If you're a civilian and you're unarmed, then what can you do against a machine gun or a machete or whatever? So, it, it, but that was a Zionist attitude. And I, I should add that when the Holocaust survivors came to Israel, they were not given a warm reception. They were called sapon. So that was how they, how they were considered. They were considered a disgrace, to be quite honest, because they hadn't fought, because they'd allowed themselves to be murdered. So the attitude of uh, the Zionists, the settlers in Palestine at the time, was they were, they were fodder for the war of independence or the war of expansion or expulsion that came up in 1948. And in fact, one third of those who died in that war were Holocaust survivors. Uh, DNA, Palestine, well, let's just put it like this. I, I tried to avoid these questions of DNA, not only because I'm not a biologist and know very little about DNA, because, but because I think politically it's irrelevant. and We shouldn't get trapped into this paradigm of thinking that if you have a biological connection at 50 stages removed, that gives you some political entitlement. I don't think it does. You're entitled to whatever rights you have in the place that you live in now. And so the Jewish homeland for most Jews was the countries they lived in, just as Britain is my homeland. And if you're Ameri an American Jew, America is your homeland. But of course, uh, when things like the Pittsburgh massacre happened under Donald Trump, you remember 11 Jews were killed in the Trail Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. The Israeli Labour Party leader, Abi Gabe, uh, sent a message to the Jews of America and he said, come home to your real home in Israel. In other words, you don't belong in, is in, in the United States, which was exactly the message that American fascists and neo-Nazis uh, uh, want to convey. And the same was said by Netanyahu after the murder of four Jews in the Jewish supermarket in, in Paris, the Hypercaché supermarket, you, you may remember. Uh, it followed in the wake of the Charlie Hebdo uh, killings. And Netanyahu came to Paris and he, he, he again, he told the packed synagogue that Israel is your real home. So, I mean, that is the attitude of Zionism. It accepts the message of anti-Semites that Jews don't belong. Uh, but as for the DNA, I suspect uh, that if anyone is the inheritor, uh, has a direct lineage to the ancient Hebrews of Canaan, it's not the Jews of Europe. It's the Palestinians, ironically. And there is a lot of evidence in terms of the customs they've had and their rituals and so on, that Jewish rituals persisted for, for literally centuries amongst many of them. Uh, but that is just one of many ironies in, in Israel. Uh, the next question, the legacy of Martin Luther. Yes, uh, his, the saying of Martin Luther, the Jews are our misfortune, was the banner headline uh, on the most vicious anti-Semitic newspaper of all, Der Stürmer, produced by Julius Streicher. Streicher was hanged at Nuremberg for crimes against humanity. He was the gauleter of Franconia, uh, and he was as vicious an anti-Semite uh, as can be imagined. Uh, but the legacy 
Certainly the Nazis borrowed from the legacy of feudal anti-Semitism, including Martin Luther, but no one should be under any illusions that, the, that German anti-Semitism of the 19th century was part of, was a modern phenomena. It was a phenomena of German nationalism, which was from the top down, which was frustrated. Germany had no empire of sorts. It had a few colonies, but nothing to write home about, uh, which is why Hitler looked not to external colonies in Africa, but to making Eastern Europe a colony. Uh, and if you like, the Jews formed for the Nazis, the binding ideology between the left of the Nazi movement and the right wing of uh, the Nazi movement, the capitalist, etc. Anti-Semitism was literally the false anti-capitalism of the Nazi party. Uh, so yes, they borrowed from the memory of feudalism, but we should not think that uh, there was a direct link in continuation. Of course, uh, the Nazis, uh, in fact, the Zionists, claim that anti-Semitism is the longest hatred. It's existed for 2000 years and it will continue to exist. It's a virus that can't be tamed. There is no antidote. Uh, there's no vaccine, if you like, that can cure us of anti-Semitism. If you're not a Jew, then you're, you, you carry it. It may be latent in you, but you're still anti-Semitic deep down. Uh, this is the, the nonsense that Zionism uh, persists with. Uh, but in reality, uh, anti-Semitism uh, of the Nazis was not uh, a continuation of Luther. And the reason is simple. For Luther, there's no doubt an anti-Semite who became more and more anti-Semitic during his life. But for Luther, once a Jew converted to Christianity, that was the end of the matter. But for the Nazis, it didn't matter if you converted, you were still a Jew because it was a racial, not a religious question. And so you had the, the unique phenomena of Christian Jews. Christian Jews converted to Christianity maybe one or two generations way back to 1870, who would appear in churches with yellow stars on them, uh, or in some Protestant churches refused their admission. The Catholic churches were more benevolent. Uh, in that respect. Uh, they were much more opposed to the idea that uh, they were still Jews. And <clears throat> in fact, throughout Europe, the Catholic Church, even if it didn't do a great deal for most Jews, was quite insistent, like in Hungary, that, uh, that the Christian Jews should not be transported uh, to Auschwitz, for example. So uh, hundreds of thousands were saved as a result of that. Same was true in, in Slovakia uh, and even Croatia as well. Uh, have I, I think I've answered everything, but if I haven't, please tell me. I, uh, I, I think you have, uh, Tony. You've, uh, you've uh, put on a tour de force this evening, I must confess. Um, so, um, well, I just would like to thank you and to remind comrades that uh, our session next week uh, will continue on the Friday evening. Um, also, Tony, I think, reminded us right at the beginning, and there have been one or two comments on this, that uh, he will be producing uh, the notes and also uh, a reading list on some of the books that he's mentioned. So, uh, and we hope that maybe this one day will be turned into something more permanent, maybe a pamphlet or a book or whatever. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Tony. Thank for this evening's uh, talk and also thank the comrades who've come in ask some very interesting questions and uh, as you'll be able to see in the chat uh, I think a lot of people have learned uh, a great deal uh, about the history of Zionism. Um, apart from next Friday's session we've also got uh, a Thursday session and that will be Bob Allen talking about the London recruits and uh, those were members of the British Labour Movement, uh, uh, Communists and Socialists, Trotskyists, who went to fight apartheid uh, alongside the ANC. And uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll find that an interesting talk. There's a book recently been published uh, about the London recruits. And um, I, I know that Bob has, uh, was involved in, in, in that and also um, has some uh, connections with, uh, with the people concerned. So that's next, uh, next Thursday at six o'clock. But uh, for our work on Zionism, and Tony's continued talks, it'll be uh, six o'clock next Friday. 
Okay. Well, thank okay, you. Okay. So uh, I'll just uh, just wish uh, everybody good night and uh, the uh, and uh, thank all the comrades for attending. So, all right. Uh, good night, Tony. Go and have a rest now. Lie down. Right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.